What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the channel for a brand new edition of Collider Ladies Night Pre-Party with someone who you've probably seen a lot of. You're going to see more of Katie O'Brien. Congratulations on Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, and I caught a glimpse of you in the promotional material for Mandalorian. What? What? <laughs> Me? I might try to ask about that a little bit. Later. <laughs> right. I don't know, a little bit. See what happens. So usually I ask the same question to start every single episode, but I was I was reading up, I was Wikipediaing you, and you just seem like you had so many different career paths you could have pursued earlier on. So it was just making me curious. What is the youngest, when you were young, what is the first thing you remember saying to yourself? Like, I want to be that when I grow up. A uh, veterinarian. I wanted to be a veterinarian. I had a dog that um, was very old and was she had some digestive issues, things like that. And it was my job to like clean it up. Um, so I thought, you know, I loved working with animals, loved animals. I thought that I would uh, do that. But it turns out, obviously, a veterinarian is a really, really hard job. And when you love animals, especially <laughs> um, to have to do like the sadder parts of it. I was expecting you to pick one of the many things that I, I know. read about, but you went a different route. Yeah. I, I did the same thing. One yeah. of the first things I ever wanted to be when I when I grew up was a vet. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that also meant dealing with, you know, not just playing with puppies, kittens, et cetera, but dealing with the sad stuff. And I'm like, yeah. well, forget that career path. Yeah. <laughs> so you eventually go to school and you study German and psychology. Yes. What inspired that particular choice? I changed my major multiple times. Um, so I, I basically tested out of German, um, did some exchange programs in high school, uh, was pretty fluent. So just kind of easy major, right? It was like, check that off the list. Um, and I added ancient Greek for a second. And then I was like, okay, well, I don't know what I'm really going to do with that. Um, and then I did uh, a bunch of psychology classes already. Again, tested pretty far into that. Um, so I was like, oh, that'll be easy. I'll just add that to the side. Maybe I'll do psychiatry or neuroscience or something. And then for a while, I was also going for a neuroscience major. And the downside to it was I am not good at physics, which is funny that I'm in a movie about the quantum realm. But <laughs> I uh, it just didn't click with my brain. Math, fine. Chemistry, biology, whatever. I got this. Neuroscience, psychology, it's fine. Something about physics just didn't click. So I would have to do an entire year of school uh, just with physics credits. And it just, I was like, no, nah, I'm good. I mean, I'm jumping a little ahead with this, but but at this point in your career, are you like hyper focused on acting, or is that is that basically who you are, where you have a whole bunch of interests and you want to pursue them all? I have always been drawn to the arts. Um, I was a percussionist all throughout middle school, high school. Um, did marching bands. I I did the high school plays. I did plays when I was a kid. I had a little agency when I was a kid. I tried to do like acting jobs and stuff. Um, but, you know, being in the Midwest, there wasn't a lot of demand for someone who looked like me. Um, and so I didn't really get see any auditions. I didn't really feel like uh, there was a place for me. So I kind of thought I had to get like a practical job. Um, you know, there was a, a section of thought where I was like, okay, music therapy, maybe, you know, something with that I can still practice my art a little bit. Um, but yeah, I've always wanted to act. It just didn't seem realistic. Is there anything you saw, like work of someone else's or maybe a personal experience you had that showed you like, no, there, there is a place for you in this industry? I, I got compared to Michelle Rodriguez a lot. Um, and, you know, I, I think she's great. She's really fun, like always gets to play very cool characters. And um, the, the only thing was, I'm like, I don't look anything like Michelle Rodriguez just because we're two tough girls, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was like one of the closest things. And then, um, you know, somebody pointed out like uh, Rodriguez from Alien, you know, and so I kind of watched that. Um, started watching like uh, some more action movies and, and seeing some roles that I kind of felt like, oh, you know, that person has a strong jaw, I guess. But I just, I still never really saw someone that I, I super connected with. Well, I hope at this, at this point, like, at least I see the value in not necessarily seeing exactly someone who is right. like you, because I don't know, it just excites me when I see different kinds of people with different backgrounds 
run run the list of unique qualities that I've never seen on screen before. Yeah, I mean, you don't want someone that's exactly like you because then, oh, that's competition, right? <laughs> it's like I, I understand this side of the business, yeah. but when someone's packaging something and they say, I want a this type, right. it's like part of me is like, don't do that. But yeah. Like I under I understand what they're getting at at least. Yeah, that's that's pretty cringe too. Because yeah. then, yeah, it's, there's, it's like a funny point. Um, I, I was talking to another actor where, uh, you know, they're, they're at a level where they're not going to do like co-stars and things like that. And so they'll see uh, looking for a, you know, so-and-so type and it's that person and then they audition for it and don't book it. And you're like, well, you wanted me, right? Like it's, it, it gets to a weird point for sure. But yeah. So I'm kind of backtracking here a little. I, I was reading, I was reading in your Wikipedia that you were like one of the first members of the, what was it, the Indiana University short form improv <laughs> club or, or something yeah. of the sort. So you're, you're studying psychology and mm. German there. You're doing improv on the side, but you leave school and you become a police yes. officer. Yeah. How does that happen? Okay, so the improv troupe, um, it's funny, when, like most kids are like, oh, I wanna do comedy, and their parents are like, no, you should be a doctor, right? I was like, oh, I'm thinking about going a medical route, and my mom was like, you should be a comedian, <laughs> uh, which was insane. Uh, and when I went to college, um, I auditioned for an improv troupe. I think it was a long form. And I didn't really know anything about that. And you know, I just gave it a shot. I thought it was fun. Went with another friend. Um, and one of the guys who also auditioned for that uh, decided that he actually wanted to make his own troupe because he wanted to do short form. So uh, he saw me in the street. And he's like, hey, I really liked your audition. Like, come come to who's on first. <laughs> right? So um, went in to audition for that. And they just started it up. And we did. I did that for pretty much my whole four years there. Was it your mom that encouraged you to try that? Uh, I mean, she she encouraged me to perform always. Okay. Yeah. Um, like yeah, it was really cool. I, I didn't have much resistance from, from the parents, for sure. Um, but the police route was like, it was kind of a weirder thing. Um, you know, I've, I did martial arts basically since I was five. And when I was in college, I was looking for a job because I'm like, oh, this is expensive. Um, and they had a little career day and I showed up and they had this booth for, uh, the university's police department. And I was like, okay, what's this? And they're like, check it out. You get room and board, free room and board. I'm like, check. That's good. Thank you very much. And then they're like, you get to go to all the games for free. You get to go to, the, uh, any of those stage performances for free, all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, go on. Um, so they really sold it. And then they're like, then you go to police academy and you're a police officer. And I'm like, well, like, you know not like a real police. I was like, okay, sure. So I signed up for the program and you're basically like a cadet for a year. Um, and you just do like really general security around campus. And then you do go through police academy. And at some point it clicked to me. I was like, oh man, I'm, this is actually a real thing. And then you become a police officer. So after college, I kind of I mean, it was crazy. I was 20 years old. That's insane. Like, I, in no way should I that have been possible. It's not... Thinking about my brain space at 20. At 20? Are you serious? Uh -huh. Yeah. And I've always been, like, very disciplined, like, straight, you know, everything is in, in black or white or whatever. But you really start to see the gray as you get older. And, and it's like, okay, you know, there's a reason people do things. And it's not just, you know, because they're bad, you know. Um, so, yeah, at, at 20, that's kind of... It was kind of wild. Uh, and then after college, graduating, I was like, okay, am I going to do an extra year of physics? <laughs> am I going to go to med school? Or am I going to go just get an MD or a, a PhD and do psychology instead of psychiatry? And then all in all, I was like, I have to take a break. I can't, I can't do more school. I have to take a break for a second. And, uh, easy job essentially I already had a certificate for it and everything was to join a, a police department so I did that and in the meantime really sat down and thought about what I really wanted out of life and uh, all it was to act so I found an acting class um, built up a reel gained my confidence I had uh, my teacher Jim Doherty uh, they actually made me feel for once like I could actually do it um, so he he believed in me so much that he hooked me up with his agent, who's now still my manager. And uh, I took off to L.A. and 
gave it a shot. Oh my, I have so many questions. Yes. How specifically did he make you feel like you could do it? Maybe not his confidence in you, but some tool he gave you that made you, you know, made you feel like acting was a creative itch that you needed to keep scratching because it was that satisfying that you could do it. Yeah, I have three brothers. So a lot of, uh, of my emotional expression growing up is basically suck it up and, and move on. Um, so yeah, we're not really like a huggy, you know, cry it out kind of family or anything. So uh, I felt like I had big emotional barriers and taking that class, um, you know, we did things like coffin exercises and uh, I'm sorry, coffin exercises. Yeah, it's like where you say like how you really feel to somebody that you can no longer talk to. So, oh boy, yeah, I know. Just thinking about it, you're like, it's 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 heartbreaking, you know. And and it actually allows you to open up and uh, and express yourself in a group of people. And it's really like it, you know, preface it as like a judgment free zone, you know. So. Um, you're not sitting there being like, oh, that was so stupid, Katie. Your emotions are terrible and you're a worthless person. You know, it was always, it was very accepting. And uh, we did another exercise where it's uh, kind of similar, but you're just talking to someone, like just talking to someone. And they, no expression, just accepting it and letting, however your emotions fall, fall. Um, so that really helped me open up. And then taking that and applying it to someone else's words and someone else's experiences, um, and seeing that I could do it was, yeah, it was uh, a really big eye opener. Oh my, I'm not gonna stop thinking about that now. <laughs> um, one of the other follow-up questions I had. So you said you moved to LA. Mm. When you take that plunge and you move to Hollywood and you try to make it as an actor, what is a piece of advice you got for doing that that proved worthless and didn't help you? But then <laughs> what is a piece of advice that you would now give to another aspiring actor looking to move to Hollywood that actually did get you some momentum and start to book you some roles? Hmm, uh, proved worthless. I don't know, I feel like a lot of my experiences build up on each other. Um, I mean, I, I will say this, moving to Los Angeles, you can save up as much money as you want. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be gone, <laughs> it's not enough. Um, so it's, I think having a plan is better than having a savings. Um, I mean, both are great, but I came out thinking as a Midwesterner, I was like, I have $15,000 saved up. And like my first day, someone hit my car and oh, that was a chunk of my change gone. Um, so yeah. And then, you know, I got a job as a waitress, my first waiting job. I got fired within like three weeks. <laughs> what happened? Uh, well, it was, um. It's kind of a weird circumstance. Like I think the owner liked me and wanted to give me a shot. I wasn't great at it, um, but I'd you know, been doing it for like three weeks. And uh, they were leaving and wanted someone who could actually run the restaurant. And I'm like, well, oh, that's wow. not me. And then they also said that I would fit in better at a bar. Uh, <laughs> they said that I had a, an intimidating presence or something. <laughs> and I was like, well, I, I think I know what that's secret for. So I just... It's whatever. I got a lot to say about that. I know, I know. Um, but like, but the the interesting weird connection thing was, and I'd met with a career counselor before even coming out here through my alumni association at um, Indiana University, and she's like, "Dude, networking, networking, networking." So I um, actually hit up uh, my buddy Paul McCarthy, who's uh, not the famous singer Paul McCartney, Paul McCarthy. <laughs> He's the head of <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was uh, the head of UCLA's martial arts program. Yeah, and we went through the same hop keto program at Indiana University. So hit him up, and he was like, "You want a job?" And I'm like, "Yes." <laughs> so started working with him, um, teaching hop keto, teaching self defense, and then he uh, was doing a program through Mount Saint Mary's University, and the head of the athletics department there was an Indiana University alumni. So. I went over there, started teaching at Mount St. Mary's, and then I was like, well, what other martial arts stuff can I learn? So uh, I found this this program called uh, Little Ninjas, and it's basically an after-school program where you like, like wear all this cute little ninja gear and little headbands and stuff, and you go teach kids. They're pretty young, so 
martial arts isn't really what you're doing. You're kind of just burning out their energy to send them home to their parents. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was it was so cute, and they they do such a good job, and they take it like very seriously. They they send you through an orientation program. You got to shadow people because you're dealing with kids, so you know you got to be good at it <laughs> and professional. And there's a certain way to talk. I, I said stupid once in class. I was like, no, because that's stupid. And they were like, <gasps> Sensei O'Brien, you said the S word. And I was like, I said shit. And like, what did I say? It? Oh, stupid. <laughs> These kids are really impressive. Like, uh, my yeah. niece and nephew know what the bad S word is. I know, right? Yeah, I know. I was like, oh, that is really precious. And I'm, <laughs> I, I appreciate your, yeah. So I think it's um, it, in this job, having... They say, what do they say? It's not survival, it's thrival jobs, right? It's it's having something that you can do that can help you and specifically give you flexibility to go on auditions, to take acting classes, to um, you know have the time to constantly upgrade your materials, your headshots, things like that. I think it's it's super important. Go out to meetings, you know. Um, it's really, really, really hard to do that if you're stuck in like a nine to five. I have so many questions. Where should I go next? The first thing that popped in my mind when you were describing some of that, because I know sometimes this industry has a habit of, you know, we'll, I will get to this too, boxing someone into a certain type of role, but also boxing someone into a certain credit. And because you have the martial arts background, it was making me wonder, did anyone ever recommend like go the stunt performer route mm -hmm. and, and not do any acting at all? Not that stunt performers are not actors because they are too, but you know what I mean with separating the two. Yeah, I, I did have a lot of people ask why I didn't want to do that. And I was like, well, I don't want to be a stunt person. I want to be an actor. I, I like performing martial arts scenes in films to whatever extent they will allow me to, which most of the time is like, they'll just let me do it. Um, but I have an aversion to being set on fire. I have an aversion to <laughs> being like kicked out of tall buildings. Um, I just like, I, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I'm, I'm getting into my mid thirties. Uh, I just don't think that now's the time to have done that. If I'd come in like maybe, in my early 20s or something, I might have given it a shot. Um, but then I also had some opportunities to talk to stunt performers, and they do say that they get boxed in. You know, they're, they're like, well, now I'm trying to branch out to acting, but people see me as a stunt person. So um, I definitely wanted to steer away from that and, and say acting is my focus, um, and that's where I'm going to go all the way. So now starting to get into some of your roles, you had a whole bunch of smaller role. I hate saying smaller roles too. Now I, I want to rephrase that, yeah. but you know what I mean? Yeah. You had a whole bunch of TV opportunities before you went to Z Nation. Of all mm. those earlier ones, which one do you think helped you the most for what it was going to take to be a series regular on a show? <laughs> well, the funny thing is I didn't have a lot of experience. So I did Walking Dead and I did Halt and Catch Fire. Two very important shows. Two very important shows. Actually, oh, and I did How to Get Away with Murder. Okay. But yeah, as you said, like I would say, yeah, smaller roles. And then um, I even, when I was auditioning for Mandalorian, which I didn't know what I was auditioning for, um, I was like, oh, that's kind of a small role. And they said, there are no small roles. It is, but it is really <laughs> true. I think about yeah. it all the time. Yeah. Because if it, like, even if it's a scene where there's a ton of people and your focus is supposed to be on your lead character, if someone else in, in the back, like if a background performer is not doing what they need to do, it completely obliterates it the, the authenticity of the world. It does. I think I, I saw one time, um, and I won't drop the show or what show it was, but they just had the background performers walking in a circle. And it took me out of it. Cause I'm oh. like, they're not walking. Like it was at a mall or something. They're just walking in a circle. That's I mean, I guess if it was walking dead and they were all zombies. Right. That's sense. one thing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like a brain someone's holding up and walking <laughs> in a circle. Uh, but it, it, I think, yeah, every, every role, every part matters. Um, it all builds the experience of, of what you're watching for sure. And those smart, I'm agents of shield. I was supposed to be in one day and they were like, yeah, we liked you. So we brought you back for two more episodes. Mandalorian, I wasn't supposed to be in that much. And they were like, yeah, we liked you, so we're going to keep you in. And I was like, oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I so, need to get to that. <laughs> yeah, no small roles. Um, but it was interesting. I asked the showrunner um, for Z Nation. I was like, after, you know, I've, I've said probably a total of five lines on television, maybe less. And you're hiring me for a full 13-episode arc where I'm one of the lead characters are you okay? <laughs> and, um, you know, he's, they purposely give you like 13, 14 page auditions are really, really 
mouthy auditions, lots of dialogue, low budget show, lots and lots of dialogue. Um, and he's like, you delivered it the same every time without error. So I know that you can be consistent. And he's like, on your resume, I see that you're a black belt. That takes time, dedication, and effort. And I see that you did bodybuilding competitions. It takes time, discipline, <laughs> effort. Um, so that gave him the faith to cast me in that part, which I'm very grateful for because it was a really, really fun show. <laughs> I think it doesn't get enough credit. It was, like, really fun to watch. It was so low budget. And we're shooting outside most of the time. They're having to use natural light because lighting takes time. Yes. Um, and it just... Uh, for, for what they were given, they did so much with it. And, you know, people don't understand how hard it is to make something. <laughs> every but, every single job on a film set yeah. or, a, or a TV shoot is so valid. I could go on and on about the hundreds, if not thousands of people you see in the yeah. credits at the end of a film. Oh, yeah. So I want to go back to something that you had brought up this morning. I think I think the way you referred to it as getting only roles that felt like, I think you said henchmen. I was, henchmen I was a henchman for a long time. So yeah. if that, if that happens, how do you, how do you break out mm -hmm. of it? What, because like casting is out of your hands to a degree. You can do what you can in an audition space, but sometimes what they give you is what they give you. So what can you actively be doing to change how the industry maybe views you in that sense? Yeah. I, I use those roles as a stepping stone. Um, I think a, a lot of people, hopefully would agree is like, if you are getting cast, that's a good thing. <laughs> and if you are getting work, that's a good thing, especially when you're first starting out. And then once you start to want to branch out, I had to start turning down roles. And I, I said specifically, I'm like, I'm not doing another henchman role. So either don't send me the audition or let me tell casting or whoever, I'm, I'm not coming in for that role. That's not how I see myself. And that's not how I want to be represented on screen. And, um, there was a project, it was a really big project for a certain uh, franchise that uh, it was, again, it was another henchman role. And I turned it down. And because of that, I was probably able to audition for other projects in that <laughs> uh, <It's> universe. <laughs> just goes to show you, sometimes you make the scary decision, but then it opens the doors to other opportunities you wouldn't have had otherwise. Yep. I mean, speaking of the henchman type role, then when the Mandalorian comes your way and you're you're an Imperial comms officer, is, is taking that role more about, you know, the people you're working with? Uh, are you a big Star Wars fan in general? What made you want to take that one? I mean, again, I didn't know what I was auditioning for. <laughs> oh, that's true. Uh, that's true. But um, when they said I was Mandalorian, I'm like, okay, that's a that's the one with the, the baby Yoda, right? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, that's <laughs> I want to be on that. I mean, that makes sense. I, I'm like, do I get to see Baby Yoda? And they're like, maybe. And I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> but I I wasn't, to be honest, I was not a Star Wars fan. Um, I, my brother was. Um, and he would watch it all the time when we were kids. And I just remember uh, R2-D2 and C-3PO being stuck in the desert for years. <laughs> That's just <laughs> what I felt like it was. I was like, it's just them walking around the desert. And like every now and then Luke and, and Darth Vader fight or something, you know. And then um, once I booked it, I was like, let me give it another shot. And I watched it start to finish. And I'm like, okay, I get it. It's pretty awesome. Um, I'm way behind on the mythology because, like, everybody there's a else. Lot. There's a lot. There's a lot. Um, but I, I understood uh, the appeal. I understood why it's exciting and, and why it has such a big fan base. And then you start working with the people, and the people are amazing. Like, I, I was going through a really stressful time shooting The Mandalorian because I was also shooting Black Lightning at the same time, which is in Georgia. Mandalorian is um, not in Georgia. I don't know if I'm allowed to say where it films. I assume, I don't know. I assume people know. Not in Georgia. Not in Georgia. you safe. So um, I, I was flying back and forth. And there were some days where I would book out for Mandalorian and Black Lightning's like, mm, sorry, we need you. And I'm like, well, I, yeah, I'm on set right now. I don't know what to tell you, you know? So it was uh, stressful kind of jumping back and forth on that end. But I also was dealing with, um, like, I was just fatigued all the time. Um, my stomach, I was, like, terrible stomach pain. Uh, I was getting, like, sores on my face, like, weird stuff going on. And I was just, like, anxious all the time. And right after I wrapped Mandalorian and Black Lightning, shot Sweet Girl <laughs> in uh, Pittsburgh or whatever, came home, hospital, right away. My intestines swelled shut. I found out I had Crohn's disease. Um, 
I got treated for that. So like I'm feeling a lot better now, but it was kind of like one of those things where like, okay, I finally understand why I felt like crap. I finally understand why my performances were kind of all over the place. Um, and now it's, <laughs> it's kind of like a little more smooth sailing for me. Um, but yeah, wait, what was the question? I feel like oh, I don't totally even know. Off. All yeah. I keep thinking about is, and I've spoken to a few people about this recently. It's like this, this industry, I feel like the, the job is hard enough that oftentimes it's very difficult to prioritize self because you're afraid oh if you gosh. veer too far off course, the door will start to close behind you, but you can't pursue that path unless you put yourself first. Yeah, I, I was, and still am, I'm very much work, work, work. Like I, I love to work. I like, <laughs> I like to push myself really hard. Um, but yeah, it's nice to have little reminders, maybe not nice, but it, you, you need those reminders to, to step back sometimes and focus and take a breath. I like that, that positive spin on challenges like that. I need yeah. to remind myself of that a little more often than yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, for Mandalorian season three, when you, when you found out what you were actually doing and you were working on that role, did you have any idea that they were gonna continue that character into season three? Or was that a complete surprise when they told you? Complete surprise. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, I never, the thing about The Mandalorian is you never know what's gonna happen. They have you, um, you know, they have you read lines several different ways. Like, okay, so this one, like maybe you're a dog at heart, you know? <laughs> like this one, maybe you're evil, maybe you're good. and. So they just have you read it several several ways, and when you see the final product, you're like, oh, okay, that, I guess that's my character now. Yeah, so um, you, they're so secretive, you never know what's going on, never. And I'm, I'm just very grateful that I'm always uh, able and ready to take the call, and um, they tend to be really flexible as well. I'll add one more question, and you have the right to not answer this question, but I want to figure out a safe way to ask about season <laughs> three. <laughs> Is what you, I don't know how much backstory you come up with for, for a comms officer like that, or if you even need to develop a name for the character too, but is the backstory you developed, if you developed it for season two, even usable now, or did you have to kind of like reshape the way you approach the character for what their ultimate plan was? It's so hard to come up with a backstory when no one knows where you're going. <laughs> or at least no one will tell you. So um, I kind of just use the circumstances, kind of use, um, you know, what's what's your role? What's the purpose of the scene? What do you need to do? And what, what needs to be done? What does the other actor need? And then let them kind of take what performance they want. It's hard. <laughs> no, fair, that was yeah, a very good answer. Very difficult. Um, for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, what would you say was the most surprising thing about how a Marvel movie is made versus any other show or movie you've done? Oh, I feel like we were getting new pages and up until the last day. Um, I, you know, we, we rehearsed a bunch of fight scenes. We gave them lots of options for like, okay, maybe we could do this, maybe we could do this. And, you know, sometimes it was like, no, we can't fit that in or whatever. And then sometimes I'd show up to set and they're like, you're going to learn a fight scene right now. Um, so the, the hardest part for me though, and, and the strangest part is, you know, generally television, it has to be done next week, right? Like you got the episode done next week or it's not gonna get done. For Ant-Man, I didn't, I never knew what days I'd be working. Like the schedule changed constantly. You've got all these A-list actors that have a bunch of other stuff to do and um, everyone's flying in and out. I do not envy the ADs. I don't envy the producers. I don't envy anybody that has to be in charge of any kind of schedule for that stuff. Um, but yeah, you really genuinely never know when you're going to be there or not. And so I was like, well, I'm in London. I'm here for like four months. I want to start going to some shows, but am I going to be called into work tomorrow? It's like $100 or 100 euro. That's like $400 for a show. Um, so yeah, that, that was the thing that I think stressed me out the most. I'm trying to... Otherwise, it was, I mean, just having you have the best of the best working around you. It's, it's a lot more, in a weird way, it's lower stress. Um, because people just, it seems like they have a little bit more time to, like, breathe. Um, but, yeah, I just, I feel like, you know, going back, I could, I could probably come up with a thousand different uh, 
things of like, oh, this is refreshing or, oh, this is worse or, oh, this is better, you know. Of all the last minute changes they threw your way, which one was the most difficult to wrap your head around? And then what did you come up with in order to be able to, I don't know, access that new headspace or do that new stunt that you weren't prepared for? Um, I learned choreograph, like it, it's, it's like really fast. And the hardest part for me was with the staff that I had to use because I'm not, I don't train that or whatever. So they, I had my double, taught me all of that stuff and we spent I spent hours and hours and hours in this tent trying to get it to look close to what she was doing um so the last minute choreography wasn't that that challenging the hard part for me was there was a big fight that we had rehearsed so many times um and went to Los Angeles to shoot something else flew back that day did a COVID test, next day on set. And I thought I was gonna get several days rest in between. But you know, there's an eight hour time difference. I'm like, I'm tired, okay. So I show up on set the next day and I'm in hair and makeup and I'm being told that it's um, some other scene where I'm just like, I don't know, walking around or something. Or I'm like basically just standing there. I'm, I wasn't doing anything. And then somebody tells me, oh, it's your big fight today, huh? Are you really excited? And I'm like, what are you talking about? No, I'm, I'm just going to be standing around. And they're like, no, it's your big fight today. And I'm like, just going to set. I was like, hey, is this today my big fight? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, um, my stunt double's injured. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm like dehydrated. I'm tired. I'm like not ready for this. I, I, this is my big fight. And they're like, yeah. So I had to try to warm up the best I could. The first rep I did, I think it was even maybe a rehearsal. There's a move where I have to like uh, drop to a knee and take the baton or the whatever staff behind my head and like, I don't know, blow somebody up or whatever. I pulled my hip and it's, mind you, just me at this point. So my hip is throbbing, like all the, uh, the stunt doubles are coming up to me and they're like, or the stunt guys. Um, They've got all the massage guns or like putting massage guns on me between takes and they're like, do you need DP? And I was like, do I need what? I'm like DP. And I'm like, what is DP? I don't need DP. Like to me, that means something I don't <laughs> want to talk. I'm like, no, <laughs> that's not going to help me today. Thanks. And they're like, no, Katie, deep heat. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> what are we talking about? It's basically like icy hot, which I didn't know. But um, so I'm having them like they're rubbing this DP on me and like taking ibuprofen, whatever, massaging in between takes. And we got through it. But like I it was a struggle to walk for pretty much the rest of the movie. <laughs> oh, my. I, I have so many more questions. I'm just first looking at the time. I apologize, Christian. Um, I'll ask you one more Ant-Man and the Wasp mm. Quantumania question, and then I do want to squeeze in uh, one question about l love lives. Lies bleeding. Love lies bleeding. Mm -hmm. Okay. For Ant-Man, you had told me earlier that there's less of a focus now on the relationship between Gentora and Janet than what we see in the final film. Mm. And it was just making me wonder how might have Gentora's arc in the movie have been a little different if she had spent that time with Janet versus Cassie? Yeah, it's so hard to say. Um, I think that with Janet, it would have been more of a, a Janet redemption arc. Um, so I guess it's, it's with Cassie, it's more of Jintora accepting this outside outsider as someone who has um, helped. So it kind of is more of um, less of a redemption arc for Janet in that sense which I don't think would have really contributed much to Jintora's story. And more of, um, you know, hey, we can actually work together now. Like, you're someone I didn't believe in at first. You're a kid, you're naive. Um, but now it's like, all right, I get that your heart is in it for the right reasons, and thank you. Okay, interesting. I, always, yeah. I've, I want to explore every single corner of the world and all the different relationships. And it's like, it blows my mind how we have the quantum realm. I know. We, like even in a couple movies now of getting to go back in, we've experienced like that teeny tiny dot of it. I know, it. I know. I've, it'd be so cool if we got to do more. It's just, uh, there's, there's so much there that, you know, they just, it's basically has to be in the background. And it's such a quirky, fun little world. And um, 
yeah, they could, I, they could do limitless things with it. It's, it's like, there's, there's an interesting, I think it's Herman Hesse quote, and, and I'm not even going to try to do the quote. Um, but the concept of it is, you know, we can only write about or tell stories about what we're familiar with essentially. So even when we're thinking about what is the possibility of the quantum realm, we have to pull from situations and scenery and things that we already know exist. You know, you're never going to see like an alien that looks like something so out of this world that we haven't seen it before, you know? Um, if you've never seen lava before, it's going to be like a whole new like life-changing experience. So I feel like the quantum realm, they have an opportunity to try as hard as they can to branch out of what is actually possible, what we've actually ever seen before in the world. And it's a hard task to do, but I think it can be done. David today told me that he thinks he was just playing around, but that he thinks there's other vebs in the quantum realm. Oh <laughs> like he, he came up with this really sad story about how like they're probably just being used to produce the goo and put and but like now I need I need the web colony I need to yeah. know about them all and I need him to break them free. Do some of them have holes? Is it just the one? You know, it, I, are they obsessed with something else? Basic, yep. like he's got holes. What do they have? Yeah, skin. You know, what, what are we obsessed with here? Yeah, and and I was wondering that too because they're drinking him on the other side. You know. Like, at well, the bar, yeah. I'm like, is that Veb or is it a different? Is Veb? it his family? Do they have just like a, a Veb farm and they've just like Could pulling his goo out on and on? Yeah, about this. <laughs> David. God, that was so funny. I love David. So we. What did he look like on set? Like, what was his what was his Veb position? Oh my god! All right. <laughs> First of all, love David. We play board games together all the time. He's yeah, we're like total dorks. Um, so he is a big dude. Like he's what six two or something like that. Um. And I think he has like a recent men's health article or something where he's all fit and stuff. Uh, he was in this silly gray hat and a really tight, no matter who you are, unflattering gray suit. It's just like really awkward, uncomfortable, tight. And he's crouched <laughs> over like this and he has this little butt wiggle. So he was just walking around like this the whole time or standing like this, sitting like this. It was so cute and so hard not to laugh every time I saw him. We're in this like battle, everyone's dying and he's just, scurrying away and i'm like oh my god never thought i'd talk about butt so much with a marvel movie but I between know. the butt wiggle now and uh modok's butt crack i mean marvel so movies are all about, about captain america i mean i get yeah, yeah, no, it's fair it's, yeah that's all fair. everyone talks about <laughs> all right i'm gonna squeeze squeeze in my one question about mm -hmm. about rose and also yes. Chris. i love them both so i don't know tell me anything about the movie and working with rose as an actor's director but maybe also something about Kristen that surprised you as a scene partner okay um so love lies bleeding uh, it's a story about a bodybuilder who I'm trying to think of it all I am allowed to say, um, goes into this small town. We meet, uh, our love interest, uh, Kristen and, um, craziness ensues there on out. Uh, it is sold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's rose glass. It's a 24. So it's going to be a little wild. Um, and just when you say wild, mm -hmm. is it like, genre is it like horror leaning wild at all there you know, it, it might just be saint maude kind of you know giving me an impression of it yeah in in the original script there were a lot of saint maude kind of moments um these were like body horror that kind of thing um we kind of had to consolidate it i guess a little bit more um, i'm really excited to see what the final edit looks like but i think it's more focused on the love story and more focused on the thriller aspect so there's a it's a love thriller kind of Western. It's shot like a Western. Um, You're really, saying really, all the right keywords right now. I know. It's, it's, it's so unique, so interesting. And only Rose's brain could have come up with it. She's, um, she's got this unparalleled imagination, um, has, I think, a really, really unique sense of storytelling, um, comes up with, I think, stories that just aren't told or if they are, are told in a really, really unique way. Um, so, yeah, it was it was really great to work with her and, and getting to do a film like that where it's not all about action. It's not all about, like, you know, kicking butt or whatever. It's it's like a really heart-wrenching story, and I actually felt like I got to to connect to a character more than I ever have before. And you're, one second you're crying, you're laughing, you're just... It's, I think it's just a really full-fledged, beautiful story. 
Um, and I'm, I'm super, super excited for people to see it. And Kristen, you know, when you, when you get to work with someone who's, I mean, she's been in the industry forever. Um, she's been in some of the biggest movies in the world. Um, she's yeah been around forever. And to see that a, she's still passionate about projects. I love that. I love to see people who've been in this business forever and it hasn't crushed them completely. And they're like <laughs> super passionate about what they're doing. Um, she's, taking other steps, producing projects. She's branching out into other projects, um, working on writing stuff, things like that. Um, so to see that is really great. And then to see that uh, she's a super supportive, um, just great person to, to be in the room with. She's not not a whole, I know this like, I don't want to sound, make this sound like a bad thing. She's not intimidating. Um, she makes herself very uh, down to earth and easy to talk to. And especially for a movie like this where you, you, you have to be very intimate with somebody and, you know, it's, it can be uncomfortable, awkward, weird, whatever. Um, she's very disarming and it makes it uh, just a walk in the park. So. None of that surprises me. I've yeah. only heard the best about yeah. her as, as a scene partner and a collaborator in general. I cannot wait for that. <laughs> I'll just keep my fingers crossed for more Gentora. I want to yeah, see you in Mandalorian season three and whatever else you want to do beyond all that. Katie, huge congratulations Thank on you. everything you accomplished. Thanks for sharing your stories on Ladies Night. Thank you so much. It's been fun.